Because of the content that I'm putting out there in Escaping from Eden and the Scars of Eden, people do ask me from time to time, Paul, are you still a Christian? And there are two answers to that question. And the first is that if you went to Clement of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, Origen or Marcion, very significant Christian leaders in the days of the early church, they would have said exactly what I'm putting out in Escaping from Eden and Scars of Eden. And they'd have said, yes, absolutely, Paul's a Christian. The second answer is that, of course, when you open your mind to the probability that we are in a populated universe, of course it reframes how you see God, reframes how you see Jesus, how you see the universe, and how you understand human beings. We are on high ground in the shelter of a wooded ridge looking out across the fertile lands of the Levant. It is populated by people who are so big that the spies returning from reconnaissance are questioning whether an invasion is even possible. Their report is unnerving. They made us feel like grasshoppers. Why are these people so gigantic? They are the Anakim, a people group whose history goes all the way back to the beginning times when Bene Elohim took human females and produced the giants called Nephilim. The Anakim, so the story goes, have been among us ever since. We're in the book of Joshua, hearing the writer reaffirm the Hebrew memory of a hybridization which combined the traits of the Bene Elohim, ones like the powerful ones, the second wave of powerful ones. The fact that this hybridized ancestry is memorialized with the name Anakim is striking. The word Anakim is uncannily close to the Sumerian word for our ancient hybridizers, the Anunnaki. Anakim, Anunnaki. According to the Hebrew tradition, Anak was the progenitor of the giant Anakim. The Hebrew Anak has a counterpart in Islam, Anak, a female. Her son is the king Uj, who is also a giant. In the Hebrew tradition, Uj is called Og. Og, aka Uj, is so large that in the Hebrew tradition, we're told that his bed was 13 feet long by six feet wide. If we go to the Greek mythology, we find King Anax, the progenitor of the Anactorians, also a race of giants reputed to be 15 feet tall. So the fact that you've got these very similar names, Anak, Anak, Anax, Anak, Anakim, Ananaki, hints at the possibility that a real memory of real gigantic people has been carried by diverse cultures and traditions all around the world. Stories of giants crop up in mythologies all around the world. Celtic, Norse, Hindu, Native American, and Aboriginal Australian traditions all speak of giants sharing the planet with our distant ancestors. If these stories are rooted in ancestral memory, it would be reasonable to expect some giant remains to have been found and tested. As it happens, finds of anomalously large human remains have indeed been made and most frequently in the Americas. In the USA, between 1819 and 1859, finds of anomalously large human remains were found in Missouri, Ohio, West Virginia, Iowa, California, and Pennsylvania. 
The finds were reported in the press and for a time were curated by the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Uh, extra fingers, uh, jaws full of molar teeth and other physical anomalies really cried out for what we would do today, which is DNA testing, to find out who these gigantic North Americans were. Were they another species, or were they just unusually large and interesting people? As it happens, the remains have been repatriated in accordance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Now, their repatriation is certainly a respectful act, and I wouldn't decry that. But absent of DNA testing, we have no way of knowing if this was another species or something very different in the timeline of Homo sapiens, or if they just were unusual and very large people. The same tantalizing question applies to another group of mysterious visitors to the Levant in the second millennium BCE. The circumstances of this encounter, described in Genesis 18, relate to the conception of a child named Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, the progenitors of the Hebrew tradition. Abraham and Sarah emerged from a culture with Sumerian roots. They probably spoke Arcadian, the lingua franca of the daughter cultures of Sumeria. They would have grown up schooled in the Sumerian stories of beginnings, the ones about the sky people. Indeed, Abraham and Sarah's tradition had its own name for the Sky People. It called them the Powerful Ones. The presence of the holy name Yahweh in Genesis 18 clues us to the fact that we're not reading the original telling of this encounter between Abraham and Sarah and these three Elohim. We can be pretty confident that the word that Yahweh has replaced in the original telling is the older word Elohim, which means powerful ones. And we've seen elsewhere that powerful ones was the Hebrew way of referring to the sky people of the Mesopotamian narratives. What that means is that when we go to Genesis 18, we can find out what the sky people looked like. The story begins like this. Some powerful ones appeared to Abraham near the great tree of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Evidently, what Abraham and Sarah saw was three men, three human beings. There's no other descriptor given at this stage. They have a conversation, and it's what happens in the conversation and after the conversation that clues Abraham and Sarah that there was something different about these human-looking people who had met with them on that day. Abraham responds to his three visitors with warm hospitality. He addresses his three guests as sirs, and he and his wife then prepare food and allow them to eat. Following the meal, the conversation takes a rather unusual turn when the visitors explain to Abraham that they will be passing this way again in exactly one year, by which time, they say, he and Sarah will have produced a child. On hearing this, Sarah can't help herself laughing, and equally nonplussed, Abraham plies the visitors with questions since he and his wife are both well past childbearing. Who or what are these men to make such an impossible claim? And by the way, of course, the reader knows that within a year, Abraham and Sarah will indeed have produced a child, their son Isaac. But it's just worth noting that all during the conversation itself, what Abraham and Sarah saw simply looked like three human beings. So that's what the sky people looked like. They looked like us. But do we get any more detail? 
The answer is yes, because that story immediately leads to the next episode when these sky people go from Abraham and Sarah and visit their relatives in Sodom. And a detail there tells us something else about the appearance of these sky people. In the Sodom account, the text refers to the men as angels, though it's worth noting that the word angel really means no more than an agent, a person sent with an assignment or a message. It does not denote anything about the agent's biology or genus. Once again, the editor of the Sodom story refers to the visiting sky people simply as men. In this passage, the editor has reduced their number to two, possibly as a way of separating the holy name of Yahweh from the embarrassment of what is about to happen. He also tells us a little more about the appearance of the sky people as they arrive in Sodom. They are incredibly attractive. Unfortunately, in Sodom, this became a bit of an issue. If you can picture the scene of some Hollywood megastar or some worldwide pop icon turning up in a town center, just picture how young people would mob them and the kind of dynamics as they get mobbed. That is the scene that we are shown in Sodom. The people are so entranced and attracted to these sky people and a mob turns up at the house where the sky people are staying, really wanting to affect uh, an abduction and an assault. That is how dramatic the effect is on the people by these anomalously attractive, human-looking people. There's nothing in the texts that suggests that the crowd sees them as anything other than very attractive human beings, so attractive that their behavior becomes quite irrational. More than one and a half millennia later, the Gospel of Luke tells the story of a Jewish priest, a descendant of Abraham and Sarah, named Zechariah, as he burns incense in the Jerusalem temple. While worshipers are gathering outside the sanctuary area, an unusual messenger appears in the sanctuary. Something about the way the messenger appears in the room startles and terrifies the elderly priest. Don't be afraid, the messenger says. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, is going to give birth to a son. Call him John and follow the instructions I have for you. Your son will have a special assignment. The birth of John the Baptist is another anomalous birth in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Just like his ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, John's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, were too old to have children. And it was only after this odd encounter with a messenger that a pregnancy follows. Now, the fact that this account would appear to be based in some ways on the Abraham and Sarah account is curious. If it's simply the invention of Luke in the Gospel of Luke, then we can understand it. He's giving a context, he's making a theological point, but if he's referring to something that actually happened, then it is very significant that what happened runs in parallel with a close encounter with extraterrestrials, which is what the Abraham and Sarah text is. The moment you realize we're looking at Sumerian sky people visiting Abraham and Sarah. According to Luke's gospel, the same unusual messenger visits Elizabeth's cousin, Mary, to tell her that she will also be giving birth to a son. Once again, the story is of a conception that is achieved artificially, announced in a close encounter, and just as in the story of Elizabeth and Sarah, 
no sexual intercourse is mentioned. Of course, it is entirely possible that Lucas simply made these stories up. It's certainly striking that there's no parallel to these narratives about Mary and Elizabeth in the other canonical Gospels, so it is possible that Luke has simply invented these stories. Even so, he's basing those stories on an encounter with sky people, extraterrestrials, in the account of Abraham and Sarah. If he hasn't made them up, then it hints at the possibility that there is an E.T. aspect to these stories, these traditions, from the beginning of time that has been airbrushed over in the translations of generations since. And it's not the only clue in the Gospels that there is an E.T. aspect to what we're reading. The story of the hybridization of humans by sky people is arguably the oldest and most widely recurring theme in the world's ancestral narratives, continuing from ancient times until today. The family of Mamiwata narratives among African peoples around the world and the Fey tradition of Europe's Celtic peoples have both maintained an unbroken narrative of anomalous pregnancies. The stories surrounding the births of John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, Isaac, are all part of a far wider narrative tradition, far wider than just the Judeo-Christian tradition. Abrahamic, Greek, Egyptian, Norse, Celtic, Indian, and Chinese cultures, to name just a few, have all carried stories of star children. Lao Tzu, the philosopher and founder of Taoism, Emperor Taizu of Liao, and the Yellow Emperor would be examples of star children in the folklore of China. In each of these three cases, the mothers were said to have fallen pregnant following strange encounters with objects of light illuminating them from the stars. What they describe, we would call a laser beam or something like it emanating from some anomalous object in space shining down directly on the mother and doing something that triggers some kind of artificial insemination. Now what's curious about that is that Carlo Crivelli, in his painting, The Annunciation, depicts the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary in exactly the same way. An anomalous object in the sky, a laser beam, and the result is an artificial conception. Mitra in Indian mythology, Mithras in the Greco-Roman tradition, carries a similar story. In India, both Krishna and Vipassi, the 22nd Buddha in the Buddha Vasma, repeat the same pattern. All these accounts speak of children whose conceptions followed close encounters experienced by their mothers, experiences of contact with extraterrestrial phenomena. Of course, it's easy to imagine that such stories might have been invented as a way of adding kudos to an ancient prince or an ancient religious authority. But there are people all around the world, women who claim to have had similar experiences and that kind of story doesn't bring them any kudos. They don't make any money from it, and usually these stories are held very, very privately. So it's quite possible that the pattern that we read of in Lao Tzu, the Yellow Emperor, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, Isaac, is part of a far more prolific experience than we have ever imagined. More prolific than we've imagined because People today don't talk about it. They don't publicize it. From time to time, somebody will come forward. And I remember seeing Jane Pooley on national television in Australia saying that she had had exactly this experience, an anomalous close encounter with extraterrestrial beings, which had resulted in two artificial conceptions. Now, when somebody like that comes forward, they know they are saying something that is going to open them to total ridicule. They don't 
make money from it, they don't get anything from it. And when Jane Pooley went on television to talk about it, she said she felt she just had to honor the children that she had born, those in the normal way and those not. Of course, it's easy to imagine that in times past, such a story might have been invented to add kudos or authority to some religious leader or to a prince. But in the 21st century, a woman who comes forward with a story like that is more likely to get flagged for psychoaffective treatment. So I think we need to think very carefully about what this phenomenon actually means. How do we process it? To the modern ear, stories of star children or indigo children might sound like the language of fable and magic, but it isn't. Think in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination, hybridization, genetic engineering, genetic modification, microsurgery in utero. Today we have language for technological phenomena that our ancestors would have not had a technological framework for. They could only understand it in some supernatural kind of way. So what we have is ancient experiences that have been reported, and then between them and us, century after century of translators who had no technological language to bring to these phenomena. And so they reported in this supernatural kind of way. Today, we have experiences, understanding, technological language. That means we can look back on those reports and have an idea of what is going on. And it absolutely highlights the extraterrestrial aspect of the story. So this framework gives a wider context for who is Jesus. The moment you begin to accept the possibility that there are such things as star children, that there are anomalous pregnancies, that there is an ET aspect to them, and that the birth of Jesus and John the Baptist is based on a close encounter with sky people, the one experienced by Abraham and Sarah, it immediately widens the picture. Now there's another way in which this ET aspect reframes the story of Jesus, and I find it in Plato. Now Plato put forward the ideas that I talk about in Escaping from Eden and the Scars of Eden, namely that there is a cosmic source who I would call God, and that the whole of the material universe emanates from that creative source. It translates into the modern language of panspermia, the idea that the genetic coding for conscious life has been disseminated throughout the cosmos, and that when it lands on a hospitable planet, it generates forms of life similar to the ones with which we're familiar on planet Earth. And then Plato told of various interventions in the development of life on planet Earth that led to us as a conscious, intelligent, technological species. But our consciousness, he said, emanates from the cosmic consciousness, the source consciousness. Plato believed that you and I begin as aspects of the cosmic consciousness. We then individuate as individual consciousnesses. Then we become material beings and we have this material life in which we wrestle with the great question of can we do love, consciousness, intelligence, harmony, as a society of individuals exercising free choice. We all, that's the great question of life that we all wrestle with. And then after this material life, we return to a relationship with the cosmic consciousness. Now that parallels the way Jesus describes his own journey in the Gospel of John, that he existed before this material life, and he will exist after it. That story of his soul's migration, I believe, is told as a pattern for all of us. Plato taught that as the pattern of all human life. So when you realize that Jesus' story is an example of what Plato wrote about, you realize that he is an example of all of us. And so when Jesus reaches for a title like Son of Man to describe himself, 
which simply means human, you begin to understand to what extent he is identifying himself with us, with the whole of the human race. And then when he gives teachings that says, I am an example for you, do what I have been doing, you realize that that aspect of his similarity to all of us is one that perhaps we've underplayed and need to rediscover in a fresh way. When the Roman Empire uh, hijacked Christianity and really emphasized the aspects of worship, obedience, sin, punishment, heaven, hell, it brought a distortion into the way we understand Jesus and the gospel. I think the translation errors that were made in equating the Elohim, the sky people, with God totally distorts a picture of God. We end up with a God who is this implacable, can turn on a dime, punitive, unforgiving, violent, genociding being. And we are all cowering in fear and obedience under that authority. Now that distorts how we see Jesus because if Jesus is revealing that God, it doesn't work, it doesn't add up. Those church fathers I mentioned earlier, Clement of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, Origen, Marcion, all argued that that translation of the ancient texts should not be used as the framing for what Jesus started. And that's the view I share. We need to do the translation work again to separate those ideas out and understand that many of the stories we've told as God's stories are really the recollections of our ancestors bumping up against an invading extraterrestrial force who have had a hand in the development of our species and in the lives of people who have been very, very significant to human culture through the ages. Think Lao Tzu, think John the Baptist, think Abraham and Sarah, think Jesus Christ. There is a massive reframing that we need to do. How do we understand the universe, God, and our place in the universe? All that changes when we go back to the ancient texts and understand we're reading about extraterrestrials. The reframing of Jesus that comes from the ET narrative is a one that opens up my vision of him, that he's not someone who came to start a religion and be obeyed, and if you don't, then you'll be punished. I believe his teachings were given to help people. And that is the conclusion I'm reaching. I believe he shows us what's possible for a human being. That's the conclusion I've drawn. I believe he's there as our model to show us what human consciousness, and intelligence can look like. So I am still a huge fan of his teaching and I would recommend anyone go back and look again and look at him outside of the context of the imperialistic, disempowering, fear-mongering religion that has often been associated with him. That's the journey I'm making and in Escaping from Eden and the Scars of Eden, and in everything I'm doing on my channel and The Fifth Kind TV, I'm simply seeking to share that journey.